When we're doing fence schools and teaching people how to build fence, we use a rule of brace rails should be twice, two and a half times actually as long as your fence is tall. And what that does, you've got your brace wire that runs kind of horizontally at an angle. If you real, build a real short brace rail, it increases the angle of that brace wire where not only is the fence pulling on your corner post, that brace wire is pulling that post up out of the ground. But if say we're building a 48 inch tall fence, we use a 10 foot piece of pipe or post or something for a brace rail so that it gets the length of that, the angle of that brace wire flatter so it's not pulling up on that post. And if I build it properly, get my corners three foot in the ground, a single H built properly will hold anything a double H will break whole without near as much labor or materials. Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I am your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, where we connect you with beef industry experts and leaders to improve your own operation. Speaking of improving operations, I'd like to personally invite you to attend my monthly Rancher Mind events. Rancher Mind events are Q&A calls between cattle producers and industry experts that allow you as the cattle producer to enter a community of people who support and push you to find those improvements and connect with experts who can answer your questions and guide you in the right direction. You can find out more about these events and how to sign up by heading over to my website, casualcattleconversations.com. And while you're there, if you sign up for my newsletter, I'll send you 22 ranch management tips for free that have been shared by the gurus who have been on my show before. Remember, the best way to support podcasts is to share, rate, and review the show so that I know what episodes and content you like and want more of. With that, let's connect you with this week's guest and expert. Well, good morning, buddy. I know we just talked a little bit off of the recording and it is sure winter out there. <laughs> and uh, so I guess that's really fitting for our conversation about winter fencing and kind of what that means for cattle producers during this time of the year. So can you start off and just remind folks, I know you've been on the show before, but just remind folks where you're located and a little bit about what you're doing in the industry today. Sure. Uh, located in eastern Kansas, a little small town called Richmond, Kansas. It's a farming ranching community. Uh, I work for Gallagher Animal Management, the director of sales, but my wife and I run a small registered Angus cow herd. So not only do we sell the products, we use them in real life and experience all the trials and tribulations of the electric fence industry. Well, awesome. And so... With that, just jumping right into the conversation, when we're looking at electric fence and these harsh winter conditions that so many people are experiencing, we're recording this on December 22nd, so so much of the Midwest is experiencing blizzards and cold snaps and all of that good, well, not good stuff, bad stuff. What, how are those electric fences impacted by the cold and snow or even ice? Well, that's something that impacts all fencing and there's some things to think about when you're using electric fence in the winter time and mostly we think about temporary electric fence in the summertime when we're rotationally grazing and trying to better use our forages but it's as equally important in the winter time if we're using trying to graze some stalk residue or if we're regrazing some pasture where we've stocked by stockpile some forages so some things to consider is you know, in the summertime when it gets dry, the ground's hard, but nothing like now when it's frozen down four or six inches deep. So you need to kind of pre-plan and go ahead and get your tread in post where you want them, your fences up before the ground freezes so you can get your post in properly. Another thing in the wintertime with the snow and ice load on temporary fence, you're probably going to need more post than you would normally because with the snow and ice load on the wires and the tapes, you're going to need more support for that fence. Now, I know we're all sitting on some snow cover now, and if we've got cattle out on open pasture where we've been grazing them, you know, 
a electric fence is a mental barrier, not a physical barrier. So they've got to be able to see it. Well, a lot of times in the summertime where the grass is green or the brown dirt, we want a white product to contrast to the background so the animals can see it before they walk into it. Well, in the wintertime, we've got the same concerns. So rather than using a white product, we may need to use an orange or a green or some kind of wire or tape that has got some color to it that differentiates it from the snow cover. Well, that, that is great <clears throat> insight and it sure is a winter wonderland and very white out there for so many people. Now, let's talking about the effectiveness of the fence and that charger, how are energizers impacted by this snow and ice? How can they be impacted and how can that impact their performance? Well, the charger itself, probably the cold weather doesn't affect it as much as long as we keep it protected from any kind of precipitation. I mean, a lot of chargers are made to sit outside, but if we're using solar, we've got to keep that panel cleaned off. The other thing you have to think about is real dry, frozen snow is more of an insulator than it is a conductor. So sometimes cattle stand on six inches of powder snow will not get the effective shock they will of standing on the ground. So we may need to look at a two wire system of a hot and ground so that we actually carrying our ground with us because standing on that snow, they're not going to get the impact of that charger they will as standing on grass or bare ground. Is that something that you recommend producers do right away in the fall before that snow hits? I mean, that's kind of what I would do. I don't particularly like fencing any time of the year, let alone when it's cold. But for those people who do always have hard winters, is that something that they should just plan for right away? Absolutely. Go ahead and make your plans in the fall before the winter weather hits. Like I said earlier, get your fences kind of laid out like you want them. I know about a week ago, we knew this weather was coming. So we set up some round bales for wind breaks, put a single poly wire around them up probably about 36, 38 inches tall. And that way the baby calves can go under and get up next to the straw bales or the hay bales for protection, but yet it keeps the cows from eating up my windbreak. So that's one way we're using electric fence today in the extreme conditions we're in. Well, that's a, that's a creative solution. And I appreciate you sharing that. Have you seen other producers doing similar things or other um, creative ideas? to uh, get through winter fencing? Oh, absolutely. Uh, a lot of people, when you're using a lot of high tensile permanent fence that's electrified, we'll go out and uh, loosen the wires a little bit just so that snow load doesn't break, break over our corners or our line post because that snow really creates, when it starts drifting, it really creates a load. And if you've got all the pressure on your corners that they will take and then you put a snow load on them, you're just increasing it. So in the spring, you're probably going to have to go back and do some repairs. So knowing we're going to have a big blowing snow, we'll go out and loosen our permanent fences a couple of three inches on a thousand feet just to give them some more stretch and some more flexibility to take that load. Is there a specific design for the corners then that you recommend? I mean, you just said that you loosen your wires a little bit, but that actual corner structure itself is so critical. So is there a specific structure for the corner that you recommend? Yes. Uh, when we're doing fence schools and teaching people how to build fence, we use a rule of brace rails should be twice, two and a half times actually as long as your fence is tall. And what that does You've got your brace wire that runs kind of horizontally at an angle. Well, if you real, build a real short brace rail, it increases the angle of that brace wire where not only is the fence pulling on your corner post, that brace wire is pulling that post up out of the ground. But if say we're building a 48 inch tall fence, we use a 10 foot piece of pipe or post or something for a brace rail so that it gets the length of that, the angle of that brace wire flatter so it's not pulling up on that post. And if I build it properly, get my corners three foot in the ground, a single H built properly will hold anything a double H will break hold without near as much labor or materials. Okay, so what about 
insulators. Uh, do producers need to be using different types of insulators in the winter months? Um, what does that look like? Not really a different kind of insulator. I would use an insulator that carries a warranty of some kind. Um, insulators take a lot of abuse from, um, you know, deer, pronghorn, antelope, the elk crossing fences. So you want a good insulator because if it fails and you're using pipe corners, you've got a dead short. Um, there's two, basically two kinds of insulators. You've got a pin lock, which actually you put the wire in a slot and drop a pin in behind it. And then there's the W or claw style, a lot of people call it, which to me are a lot stronger, a little more difficult to put in, but a lot stronger to use. So it kind of depends. If I'm in a flood prone area, I may use a pin lock so that that pin will shear and actually take the pressure off my post. But if I've got a lot of wild animals crossing the fence, I tend to use a claw or a W style insulator just because it's stronger. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing all that insight. Now, earlier you mentioned grounding and potentially having to switch to a two wire system, depending on your location. Is there anything that needs to be done differently grounding wise during these winter months to maintain that charge on your fences? Well, if I'm going to use what we call a true hot ground system, I will run one wire from my hot side of my energizer, the generally the red terminal to one wire in my fence. And then the other wire, I will hook to the green ground terminal, which is also where my ground rods are hooked up. And that way it's a true hot ground system. A lot of people want to call a hot ground system where they just have a hot and a neutral. But to get the full effectiveness of a hot ground system, you need to hook your ground wire back into the ground system on your fencer, energizer. And this, you don't depend on anything then, moisture in the ground or no snow or anything to carry that current back to the energizer because actually for the animal to feel a shock, that current has to make a full circuit. It has to go out the fence and then return to the energizer through the animal's body before they get the shock. So a hot ground system, a little more difficult to build, but a lot more effective in either arid areas or where we've got a lot of snowpack. All right. Well, buddy, you're the expert on this. Is there any other information that you want to share with cattle producers today when it comes to winter fencing? You know, I just think that there's a lot of underutilized forage in crop residue in pastures, hay fields that maybe got some growth on them in the fall when we got some moisture. You know, hay's, we start losing money the day we set out the first bale of hay in the livestock business. So anytime we can go back and let those animals do the harvesting for us, I think just a little pre-planning early in the fall and taking a look and kind of an inventory of what we've got for winter feed that maybe we didn't have to put the time and energy into harvesting and let those animals harvest. I mean, electric fence is pretty cheap by, per foot, both labor and materials to install. So rather than burning $5 diesel fuel, maybe we need to be letting those cows do some more of the work. Well, that is something that has been talked about on the show before and something experts in many areas have brought up. So I would encourage all producers to think about that more. Thank you, buddy, for joining me on the show today for this quick but very informative episode. I really appreciate your time and sharing your insight with the listeners. Well, thank you. We always enjoy getting the word out and trying to help people do a better job and be more efficient. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.